What's up, what's up, live? How's everybody doing? I hope you're doing well. What I want to briefly talk to you guys about today is how you can eliminate the fear for those of you all that may have this fear of going broke. I know all of us have, at times felt like we didn't have the amount of money that we wanted to have on hand. Maybe you felt like you weren't making the amount of money that you know that you deserve uh, to be making, or maybe even the amount of money that that um you felt like you wanted, whether you, you know, deserve it or not. Let's just be real sometimes. But what I want to do is actually kick off today's live stream by showing you guys behind the paywall. And these are some results of just one of my clients. All right. I'm going to show you these numbers, but then I want to show you how you could do this for yourself. Um, for those of you all that, you know, are super independent and really don't want to, uh, you know, waste any time. All right. So let me break this down really quick and then I'll get this off the screen. So the number that you guys see, the $41,442 is not my money. Let's start off there. That is not my money. That is the money that my client received. All right. The 10,000 and change is what my fee is for generating them that much money. So if you want to see what the net profit is, you guys know I got a South Carolina education, but let's do some simple math. So I helped them generate $41,442. All right, you guys can see the breakdown, how much they made in the last week, how much they made over the last 30 days. Subtract what, you know, my fee is $10,499.00. 98 cent. All right. Means that their net profit was $30,942 and two cents. All right. So the reason why I'm starting off here is because, um, I can't give you guys my clients information for obvious reasons. Um, but what I do want you all to at least see is that what I'm going to share with you all today is things that make people real money. Right. So I help my clients have 30 K plus months. Uh, you know, some have way bigger months. Uh, I have certain clients that have a uh, six figure plus months as well. Right now. Um, I'm not here to promise that everybody here will have six figure plus months because I don't know your situation. I don't know what you're willing to do, what you're not willing to do. And if you even have that ambition or not, but what I will give you is some fundamentals that will allow you to get up to 30K a month, right? Does that sound fair? You guys talk to me, all right? Does that sound fair? Let's talk about some basic fundamentals that I believe we can apply to everybody's lifestyle here that would allow them to get to, you know, at least that 30K mark. I don't know about you, but I feel like I know a lot of people that if they can make $1,000 a day working for themselves, their life will be a little bit better. I'm not saying that you're going to, you know, buy a longer life or anything like that, but a lot of problems can be solved through improving your financial situation if we're all adults here and we're going to be serious. So let's first start off with the mindset. The reason why I have to start off there is this, is because if you give the right answer to the wrong person, they still won't be able to get the right result. All right, here's a quick example of this because I use this uh, phrase every time, but it's important that you memorize this. Let's say Floyd Mayweather walked in right now and said, hey, JT, I'm going to teach you everything that I know about boxing, right? Then you got to go fight Bud Crawford after I, after I show you, right? Maybe not even Bud Crawford. You got to go fight Mike Tyson, who is probably, what, 50, 60 years old, all right? I'll still get knocked out, right? Let's be real. Why? If if the undisputed, you know, uh, what what is Floyd? Light heavyweight champ, right? One of the best records of all time. You would assume that if this caliber of person came and taught you everything they know about boxing and then you went and boxed, you should be able to win a fight. Well, guess what? I'm not the right person, all right? I don't have the muscle memory because I don't have the experience. I'm not in the shape of a boxer. I don't have the conditioning. There's a whole lot of things that just giving me the right answer doesn't provide me. So 
even if I know what to do, I'm not fast enough to do it. I'm not strong enough to do it. All of these things. Think about that in terms of your business, right? Think about that in terms of your business. Somebody can tell you, hey, listen, do this, do that. But if you're not mentally in the right shape, to be able to execute properly on the information that you're given, then to you, it's going to seem like this can't be the right answer, right? Or this stuff doesn't work. Such and such just took advantage of me. Make sense? All right. So that's why we always start with the mindset first. That is trying to build up your conditioning to make you the right person. So that way, when I give you the right answer, then you can go and execute on it properly so that way you can get that positive result, all right? So the first example that I want to give you to help improve your mindset is this. I have people hit me up every day, say, JT, I have this amount of money, that amount of money, what should I invest in? Or JT, if all you had was this amount of money, uh, what would you do? Now, I don't have a whole lot of cash on me. I normally don't keep any cash at all. So I have 20, 40, 60, 80, 90, 100, 110, 11, 12, 13, 14. So this is only 117 bucks, right? Not going to lie, like there's a trillion of dollars or nothing like that. I'm sure some of you all have way more cash on you right now than this, right? But just for illustration purposes, and this is all the cash I have on hand, let's assume that this was all the money I had to my name, right? I'm down to my last 100 or whatever I said this was, $117. What some people will do is say, okay, well, my mom called mom need $40, okay? I give mom $40 because that's mama. Okay, well, the kids need $50 for something related to school or shoes or whatever. Okay, I'm going to give $50 to that. Okay, well, I got to fill up the gas tank. That's going to be another $25. So that's 10, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. Okay, $25. And then they get to their last $2 and they say, hey, if you were down to your last 20, uh, if you were down to your last $2, what would you do to make $10,000, JT? What would you do to make $1,000 before the rent is due on Friday? I want you to know that if this is you with any amount of money, but just for illustration purposes, right, this is all I had. If this is you, that is the first mistake you're making. So if we want to start preparing ourselves to never go broke again, set ourselves up to have these 30K or better months, we have to stop doing that. A lesson that I learned in the United States Marine Corps. So I went from high school straight into the Marine Corps. And for years, I took it for granted because I figured if I knew it, then everybody else knew it. And that's a nugget as well, because a lot of you all discount what you know just because you're the person that knows. it. Let's stop doing that immediately. All right. If you're willing to commit to that, put a one in the chat. Stop discounting the value of what it is that you have discounting the value of what it is that you know simply because you're the one that that has it, right? You'll say, well, I'm not rich. I don't know no rich people. So, of course, what I know, what I have can't be valuable because I'm not a six, seven, eight, or whatever figure you would like to be type of person, right? So, what highly successful people do is they become proactive, not react. So, if I'm down to my last 117 bucks, and I know if mama call, I want to give mama $40. If the kids need something, I want to give the kids $50. If uh, the, the gas needle is almost on E, I need to put $25 in the tank. But if I do all of that, I'll be left with $2, and that $2 is going to put me in a bad space. What I should do is say, okay, what asset can I invest in with part of or all of this and have an asset that can create me recurring revenue, all right? So you guys know that right now a project that I'm working on is my financial literacy board game, which is a part of my generational wealth kit for people out there that, that need that. But I'm also doing a Christian card game. Now, this is obviously not it. This is just a sample pack of cards that I bought just to, you know, get the, the information I needed to provide it to the manufacturer for my cards, right? So just a standard, basic, uh, you know, pack of playing cards, right? Well, guess what? In the store, depending on where you shop, you might get a pack of cards for a dollar to three dollars. If you wanted a fully customizable card game 
And I know this because I'm ordering samples from different manufacturers right now. Hence the reason why I needed this to be able to give them some, some measurements and talk to them about the quality of cards and all of that other blah, blah, blah stuff. And I'm making a bigger point here. So stay with me, right? It costs between $108 to $155. It depends on the manufacturer and it depends on the quality. Do you want it matte finish? Do you want it gloss finish? Do you want it standard size? Do you want it tear it car size? Uh, do you want it this thickness, that thickness? All of that stuff. What's the point, JT? Let's say I had just this money to my name. What if I said, okay, I have an idea for a card game, right? It could be a Christian card game like I'm producing. You guys will see and hear more on that as we get, you know, uh, closer to the finish line on that. It could be, you know, uh, any kind of game that you have. Do you know that the tabletop industry, tabletop industry is board games, card games, pretty much any physical game outside of a video game uh, is, is generally classified as a tabletop game, right? Is a $13 billion per year industry. A lot of that is absorbed by Mattel and Hasbro, the average independent game designer, which is what you and I would be considered make around between 80 and 180 grand a year, right? So if I took this money and I invented a card game, all right, and I only got one made. Let's let's be honest. So I spent that same money. I got two dollars left, but I spent all of this money on creating an asset. Guess what I could do with this prototype? In business, we call this prototype, and of course, just use your imagination, a minimal viable offer, right? Or minimal viable product, or minimal economical viable offer, right? So different people call it different things, but in a nutshell. I can now take this and I can show it to people and say, hey, look, I got an idea for a card game for people that like whatever. Do you want to learn magic, right? Do you want to learn entrepreneurship? Do you want to teach kids, you know, whatever you want to teach them? Do you want to teach adults, whatever you want to teach them? Does, uh, do you want to do a sci-fi or fantasy game, right? So I can then take this product, I can market it, I can pre-sell it, right? And after I market and pre-sell it, let's say that I, I raise, just for easy math, a thousand bucks, right? I pre-sell this at a discounted price so people buy it early. I make a thousand bucks. Out of the thousand bucks, I go to the manufacturer. I spend whatever it costs to get it manufactured, right? Let's say, again, just for easy math, 700 bucks, so 700 bucks gets enough orders made to serve my pre-order clients and leave me a small inventory left. Now what do I have? I have an asset, which will be the inventory of cards that I have, and I have these $2. So now what can I do? I can sell my product, my service, my information. I'm just using this as an example. Some of you all have a product. Some of you all have a service. Some of you all have an information or aspire to have it, but now I have an asset that I can sell over and over and over again, right? All of you all have seen these Maverick jumbo cards, either in Walmart or the dollar store or wherever, right? These simple playing cards are everywhere. Well, guess what? Once upon a time, somebody had to invent this, right? And somebody is still obviously currently printing these cards and they're still in production. So this serves as an asset for whoever the manufacturer, not even an, uh, well, whoever the owner is, because the manufacturer and the owner could be different, right? So whoever the owner of this IP, intellectual property is, now has an asset they can sell over and over again. So what can I do? I serve all of my pre-sale clients first. Let's say it leaves me with a small inventory. I can sell that inventory as well and now I generate more money. What do I do with that more money? I now, then I take the money that my asset makes me, and that's the money that I spend to give mama $40, the kids need $50, the gas tank need $25, right? 
So we invest our money in assets. Why? Because if we have an asset, we have something that can make us money perpetually. If I just worked at McDonald's, made a hundred and uh, 17 bucks or whatever amount of money I keep forgetting because I got South Carolina education. But if I just worked at McDonald's and let's say this was my paycheck and I just broke up the money between mama, kids, gas tank, right? Now I'm stuck with $2 and I feel like life ain't fair. Why won't nobody help me? I'm a good person. I do stuff for my mama when she need it. I do stuff for my kids when they need it. But when I need help, everybody just look at me crazy with my $2 and say, hey, that's on you, right? So I want you all to understand that one mindset shift, I need all of you all to have immediately. And I see a lot of ones in the chat saying that you're going to commit today for anybody that got in the room late. One in the chat means that you're not going to discount what it is that you know and or what it is that you have just because you're the one with it. I don't care if you never made a hundred thousand. I don't care if you never made a million. I don't care if you never made $10,000 before, right? Stop discounting what you have simply because it's in your possession. That is the biggest mistake I see a lot of people making that deserve to make way more money, but they feel like they don't deserve it because I don't make a lot of money. I'm not a rich person. I'm not a high income earner. Nobody would pay X amount of money for what I know or for what I have. And that belief system is so embedded in their DNA, they find it unethical to sell somebody what it is that they have, what it is that they know for a value that they deserve, right? So what we're going to do now is when you get your money, even before you get your money, right? And I'm glad that we're doing this live on a Sunday. When you get your money, before you pay the light bill, the water bill, the internet bill, right? I'm not telling you not to pay it. What I am telling you is have a plan to make your money back from an asset you control. From an asset you control. What does that mean? Not just your nine to five job. I hope you never get laid off, but I also don't have the power to ensure that you never get laid off, right? So that's the first mindset shift that we got to make, right? Makes sense? So we're going to start investing in assets because once I break up my money to whoever needs my money and I do it that way, I still have the asset, right? I still have the asset. I still got the playing cards. I still got the the food trailer. I still got the, the course for those of you all that sell courses. Uh, I still got the merch line for those of you all that sell clothes. I still got the whatever it is, right? Create that asset and let your asset pay all of your liabilities, right? And don't let other people discount you and say, hey, who would buy your card game? Who would buy your board game? Right. Let the market decide by doing proper market research, proper market research. All right. Let's move on to the next point. But I, but that's super important. I, I, I didn't want to discount that and not do it an injustice. Right. The, the next mindset shift that we're going to add to that is I want you to adopt my good farmer framework, my good farmer mentality. All right. This has allowed me to go from economic situation to economic situation. And overall, my life has not changed, right? What do I mean by the good former mentality? Well, I'm a country boy from the Carolinas, right? Fun fact, my great grandmother, I never had the opportunity to meet her or, or meet her, right? You guys can tell I can't talk. So I never had the opportunity to meet my great grandmother. She passed away before I was born. Um, but from stories from my aunts and et cetera, tell me that my great grandmother was a slave, right? My great grandmother was a slave. My grandmother wasn't, but her mother, right, was, right? So my great grandmother was a slave, all right? My grandmother did a lot of agricultural work, right? Later on in life, she was able to, you know, get a factory job, but a lot of her life was spent, you know, outside working in the elements, all right? So there, there's something that, I mean, I feel like everybody has heard of called uh, being like a, a, a sharecropper, 
uh, something like an indentured servant, if you will, where basically uh, you would work somebody else's land uh, in order to have a place to stay, uh, food to eat, and then they'll give you a small amount of money. All right. Um, so that was a, a, the bulk part of uh, my my uh, my grandmother's experience. Right. I, I share that with you because uh, I have a little bit of agriculture in my history and I would venture to say that maybe you do as well, whether you in the South, in the North, West, Midwest, whatever. Right. So uh, what I know is this, and I'm not the perfect farmer. You guys know I'm a robot farmer, meaning that I have robots that grow our own food uh, for us. So we can, uh, so, so we do it completely passive now. Um, but what I do know about being a good farmer is that good farmers always keep sowing. A good farmer doesn't take one seed, put it in the ground and say, okay, I'm going to wait and see what this one seed is going to do. A good farmer is going to do a crop, multiple crops, right? Maybe even different kind of crops, right? And they're going to have a plan on what they're going to do in every season, all right? So, hey, what are we going to do in this season, that season, this next season, the other season, right? So how do we adopt a good former mentality in business is not only are we proactive, so we're investing in assets to pay our liabilities. We also are not just going to invest in one asset and then sit back and say, I'm going to wait on the whole world to buy my product, my service, my information before I do something else. No, I'm going to keep learning. I'm going to keep applying what I learned and I'm going to keep investing in myself, right? I'm going to keep investing in myself, right? Here's the litmus test because everybody on the internet, myself included, has a book, a course, a, a program for you to join. How do you know what program you should join? All right. Caveat, because I just think that this is important. I want you to think of when you're investing in yourself, right? When you're buying somebody's program, their book, their course, their whatever, is think about it as, okay, how can I take what this person knows and apply it to my situation to get my result, right? If you can't see how the solution that they offer can help you get to more money, better health, better relationships, more time freedom, whatever your objective is, that should be at a bare minimum one of the things, right? So don't just look at just the money because somebody can show you how to make a whole lot of money and you have no time to enjoy it, no time to, to go spend with your family, your friends, your whatever, right? So look at the lifestyle as well, all right? That's why I'm super intentional here because if you guys been rocking with me for a while in all of my old videos, I'm jumping in and out of cargo vans. I'm taking you guys along for the ride with my delivery business. Then I'm taking you guys along for the ride when I'm doing my e-commerce, right? When I'm doing my reselling, when, when I'm doing my real estate, when I bought my first investment property and we were doing the clean outs ourselves instead of hiring a junk removal company to do it, right? But now I'm more intentional because I want you all to see the evolution of entrepreneurship so that way you can be inspired to know, okay, it looked like JT doing a whole lot of talking head videos, right? Is JT still doing business? How is he still doing business if he still has the ability to be in an office somewhere and still talk to us? Because I want you to not just know how to make the money, but how to enjoy the money once you make it, right? Also, for anybody that's here that's not aware of this, down in the description below, I'm going to give you guys a, a resource if you're out there and you're saying, hey, JT, I don't know how to make 100K a year or I don't know how to consistently make 100K in a year. That link is already underneath here. Uh, so if you are somebody watching this video right now and believe that, hey, look, JT, I need to make my first 100K or I need to know what is the blueprint to consistently make 100K, right? I'm going to put that here. Uh, underneath this video and it's already there now so the good former mentality though getting back into it so the good former mentality is this is we're going to constantly sow seeds and sowing the seeds could be creating assets if we don't know what asset to create we can invest in the knowledge 
to know what asset we should create, right? Because that's still bettering yourself. What you know is something that nobody can take away from you. No human being can reach inside your head and take out one plus one equal in two. That's something that you learned. You have that. Nobody can ever take that away, right? And, and all the other skills. Some of you all know how to cook. You know how to fix things. You, you are very creative, right? So not just investing in assets, right? Because I'm big on never investing in anything you don't understand. I don't care if it's a dollar, ten thousand, or a hundred thousand dollars. Never invest in anything you don't understand, right? So, if you don't know what to create, what assets you should put your money in, being a good farmer is investing in figuring out what that is. Not everybody is cut out for entrepreneurship, which is fine. I tell people I think you should do something entrepreneurial, but that doesn't mean that everybody is cut out for entrepreneurship. Right. So you could be an investor if you're more inclined to do that. So that's what I mean when I talk about my good former mentality. So I'll invest in real estate. I'll invest in dividends. I'll invest in equity and businesses. I'll invest in a YouTube channel. I'll invest in an Instagram channel. I'll invest in mentors. Right. I'll invest in all of these things that I put my money in. Right. Because I have the good former mentality and that I don't know. How many seeds are going to break the earth? I don't know how many crops are going to make it all the way to harvest and turn a profit. But I know what I shouldn't do is take one little seed, put it in the ground, and wait on that. Let me phrase this properly so that way nobody is confused, right? Your wealth, if your goal is to become wealthy, is going to be made through concentration it's going to be kept or maintained through diversification, right? So when we're talking about being a good farmer, you could be a good farmer in the industry that you're in. So you don't have to go from trucking to e-commerce to a restaurant to a YouTube channel to a whatever, whatever, right? You can look at what do people need before they buy your product, service, or information, what do they need after they buy your product, service, or information? What could make their experience uh, better or more pleasant as they experience your product, your service, or your information? And you can sow seeds in those areas as well. If you're a personal trainer and you primarily want to work out with people and help them build muscle, lose body fat, maybe you partner with the nutritionist, right? Maybe you get some affiliate deals with some products like some heart monitoring products that they can need, help them out with some shoes, right? If they're not familiar with working out consistently and they're showing up with, you know, Timberland boots on, you can say, hey, look, this is what I recommend you to wear when you're working out to avoid injury and et cetera, right? So I still want you to commit to being a good farmer, but I don't want you all to say, I am going to learn the stock market real estate, uh, how to be an electrician, how to be a barber, how to, you know, build houses from the ground up, how to, you know, do crypto, all right? Because that's when people spread themselves too thin, right? Being a good farmer is not spreading yourself too thin. Sometimes people confuse those two. So that's why I wanted to make sure that you guys got it. All right, I'm gonna go to the chat real quick before we go to the next point, just to make sure I haven't lost anybody. I'm not trying to talk over anybody's head, right? I'm not trying to talk over anybody's head. I just want to make sure everybody understands it. Shout out to Texas. Shout out to Memphis. All right. Boom. Assets equal revenue. That's a fact. All right. Boom, boom, boom. So definitely. And I don't want you to think assets are only reserved for rich people for people that have a whole bunch of followers, no. Assets are for everybody. I want you to think of an asset as something that can make you money that takes very little or no or none of your time, right? Very little or none of your time, all right? 
going back to the card example, just because I see some people mentioning it, right? So once you develop your product, this is just my prop product for illustration purposes. Let's say I invented the Maverick Jumbo playing cards, right? Once I invent this, all right, I can now partner with a distributor. So, okay, you can buy it online. And when you buy it online, it's not sitting on a desk in my office. And I got to come to the office, grab a deck, put it in the envelope, write out the address, and then take it to the post office and send it off, right? That person can get a notification. They'll go pick it off of the shelf, package it up, ship it out to you right? It can be completely hands off uh, for a physical product like that. A lot of you all, if you're interested in digital products, you can use software to immediately deliver the course, the software, the plugin, the theme, the whatever your digital product is, right? So I don't want you to shy away from understanding that it doesn't matter if you want to do something physical or something digital, uh, I want you to understand you can create an asset that takes very little or none of your time. I believe everything can be automated through software, hiring other people, or both, all right? Anything can be automated through software, hiring other people, or both, all right? Um, residual passive income, reinvest to another asset, 100%. 100%. Yep, have a budget, 100%. Happy Sunday, everybody that's here. All right. Um, boom, boom, boom. Are you growing fruits or vegetables on your property? Just curious because I started growing tomatoes and I'm going to plant papaya because they bear fruit fast. Yep, yep, yep. So um, I'm growing. I got muscadine grapes in the backyard of my Airbnb. Um, I have a fig tree at my media house. Uh, I have a, I have three fig trees, a raspberry garden, a pear tree, and then I got my tower that has like 30 different vegetables on it at my primary residence, right? So yeah, so I, I grow a lot of stuff, right? We don't talk a lot about it here on this channel because it's, you know, people are more interested in making money than growing food, but I'm a, I'm a country boy. So shout out to you, anybody out there that grows their own food. All right, but let's keep it going, though. Back on task. I want you all to understand this. Hear me clearly. I want you to also brace yourself because this is going to sound ridiculous when you first hear it. I heard somebody say this over a year ago, and it took me a whole lot of, like, meditating and asking other people, did you understand what he said? It didn't make no sense to me before it finally sunk in, all right? What this person said was that it's easier to make a whole lot of money in a short amount of time than it is to make a little bit of money over a long period of time, all right? When I tell you, when I heard somebody say that, I said, you know what? I, I have no idea what we're talking about. Doesn't make any sense. That don't even sound humanly possible how is it easier to make a whole lot of money in a short amount of time uh in comparison to making a small amount of money over a longer period of time right i like that that's ridiculous right that's what i thought and i'm gonna be honest with you. it took me over a year of having different people explaining and say do it make sense and i'm like kind of but not really so I, this is what i understand it to me right um, and I and I just like to use examples because I feel like that makes it real for me. Might make it more clear to you as well. Let's say that you wanted to sell your own shoe, right? Matter of fact, you guys know that uh that I I used to sell my own shoe. All right, we discontinued it. I still got a pair up. Uh, I'm looking at now. Um, but we no longer do it. All right, it is very hard for the average person, um, and I'll just pick on myself, to try to come out with their own shoe and sell it. However, Gucci has no problem at all selling shoes that could be a 100 times or greater more expensive than my shoe, right? So my shoe could be $20, 
And I could be begging everybody I run into, will you buy my $20 shoe? Will you buy my $20 shoe? And people say the shoe is ugly. The shoe is crazy. Nobody about to give you $20. Why would I wear your shoes, JT? You not an athlete. You not a blah, 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 right? But if Neiman Marcus was coming to sell a $2,000 Balenciaga, Gucci, you name it, Prada shoe, They'll have people that would be upset when they sell out because they didn't have the opportunity to get it, right? So what I want you to understand is this, is that what I take it to mean is there is a whole nother world that a lot of us that come from low-income environments were never privileged to even know exist. All right. Like you guys ever seen the movie, The Chronicles of Narnia, where the kids go to the back of the closet and then they I think it's called The Chronicles of Narnia. Somebody will correct me if I'm wrong. But I remember reading the book in school and then we watched the movie. But you go to the back of the wardrobe and then it's a whole nother world. They didn't even know exist back there. Right. Or Alice in Wonderland when she go down the rabbit hole and realize it's a whole nother world. Right. Well, I want you to know that there is a whole nother world where there are people that prefer to buy higher end items, right? By the grace of God, due to networking and et cetera, I've been able to meet a lot of people from that world and it was shocking to me. So what I take that to mean and what I would encourage those of you all to consider is why not target a demographic of people that make an above average amount of money with something that they find valuable. The reason why I believe most people never do this is because they suffer from either a conscious or unconscious version of imposter syndrome, meaning that you don't understand how valuable you are to the marketplace. So I challenge you all to understand this. Hey, why not think about what can you do to serve people at a high level? A lot of the, the high six and seven figure marketers uh, or in business owners and content creators and you name it, right? They spend a whole lot of money on software and payroll. If you had a product, a service or information that could assist them in getting the software that they need to run their business getting the personnel that they need to run their business, those people will happily pay. you. I've been preaching this same sermon for the better part of this year, and I'll probably continue preaching it until everybody, you know, uh, agrees to it or at least understands it. Nobody is never going to be a chance to win when everybody agrees to it. But B to B is where you should be. Business to business. B to B is where you should be. All right. That means that your primary customer you should serve should be another business. Why, JT? It is way easier for you to serve other businesses, charge them a premium amount of money, and get their business than it is to try to get an individual, right? I'm telling you guys, I'm paying over $100 a pack. And I've ordered like over eight packs of these from different manufacturers because I'm deciding which manufacturer I'm going to partner with to be my manufacturer, right? So uh, my team designed it, but we not card manufacturers. So we went out and found who we think are the best card manufacturers and we paid all of them to make us a sample, right? So on a business level, spending 108 to slightly over $150 for a simple pack of cards, right? These cards not made out of gold. They they don't they don't bring back the dead. Like these are just every day the same cards you guys got that you play spades with or whatever you like to play, right? These are those. All right? But as a business, I'm willing to pay a manufacturer to send me my own custom deck of cards. That's going to be made out of the same material as these, except it's going to be designed with my stuff on the front and back, on the cards and on the box, right? Why? Because as a business decision, it's an investment. And when we invest, we have an expectation of a return on that investment. If for whatever reason we don't get the return that we want, we can take a tax write-off 
for attempting to, you know, invest in our business, add this other product in this case, and, you know, it just didn't work, right? But if you came to me as an individual, matter of fact, let me ask you guys, right? If, if, if I came to you as an individual and say, hey, I got a pack of cards, it's $155, they not made out of gold, diamonds, any precious material. They made out of the same thing, you know, regular playing cards is made out of, right? What would be a reasonable response? Man, you crazy. Ain't nobody giving you $150 or $108 for no pack of cards, JT. You are out of touch. You done went crazy. You whatever, 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 right? It's, and that would be the nice things that they say, right? Some people might add some some colorful language in there if I if I told them to give me a hundred and something dollars for a pack of playing cards, right? The, what's the point, JT? I want you to understand the same way that trying to sell this exact same product, like if you were a manufacturer of playing cards, all right, which they sell the printer in like Joann's or something. I just like it just doesn't make sense for us to do in the house. Right. But if you were a manufacturer of playing cards, all right, and you tried to sell it to individuals, you would get so many doors closed in your face. You would think maybe it's not even a good idea to be a tabletop game manufacturer. But if you go to the right businesses, right, you will find like, oh, man, this is one of the best businesses to be in. It's a 13 billion dollar plus industry per year. Uh, yes, a lot of that is absorbed by Mattel and Hasbro because they're the big fish in the space. But the independent group of developers make between 80 and 180 grand a year, right? So you could just cut out a niche there. All right, insert your product here. I'm just using what I got handy. But insert your, your merchandise, your jewelry, your, your food, your beverage, your course, your whatever it is that you sell, insert that in place, right? And I want you all to start understanding that you can charge more than what it is that you're making right now, what it is that you're charging right now. So somebody asked earlier, what in the world did this person do to be able to make $39,888 in the last 30 days, $6,474 in the last seven days, the 41,000 is their money, 10,000 and change is what I charge them to help them make 41,000, right? Just being honest, putting all the cards on the table, tell you guys all the time, I'm unapologetically an entrepreneur. So what I do is I help businesses make money and then I participate in the profits. But if you subtract what they paid me, and this was a, a digital uh, uh, offer that they had particularly, right? So it was zero cogs, right? For those of y'all that are familiar with that, uh, they made, you know, over 30 grand. All right. And it's because they understood instead of me trying to sell the cheapest version possible of this thing to a million people, right, at half of a penny each, why don't I find the businesses right? Whether it's the existing businesses or the people that aspire to do business or the people that are just investors that want to add this to their portfolio, right? Let me just target those people that get the greatest return on investment and serve them. And what the pushback that I typically get when, when I have this conversation with people, they'll say, JT, I want to help the small lady, the little guy, the single mom with kids, and I tell them, hey, amen, that's great to do. But you're not going to tell me that you're trying to help the small lady, the little guy, the low-income person, right, the single mom that's barely making ends meet by taking her money. That part I can't agree with you. So you're going to go and say, okay, instead of charging $2,000 to the person that makes over $2,000 a day, I'm going to charge $250 which is a way better deal than the 2000 and I'm a and I'm a pitch it to the single mom that's surviving off of government assistance and child support and working a, a minimum wage job just trying to you know do right by herself and her kids that doesn't make any sense why don't you just serve the people 
that you can serve at the highest level and just give it to her for free. If you really want to help her, right? Y'all let me know if I'm crazy. But if, if I really want to help the, the homeless man, the, the, the struggling, whatever, man or woman, person, right? Should I go sell them something? They already have limited resources. Should I go sell them something? Or should I go serve people that already have the money to pay a fair market value for what it is that I provide? This is what you got to understand. You're not overcharging, right? You're not overcharging. You're not being unethical. The manufacturers, I, I might like I said, I might have got these from like one to three dollars. I don't even remember what I paid for. The manufacturers that charge me between $108 and just over $150 a pack are not overcharging me, right? And a lot of people feel like they can't charge what they should charge because I don't want to overcharge that person, right? Why is it that paying $108 for this could be overcharged? If you're targeting the wrong people and it's the wrong value proposition, right? So when I get these samples in and me and my team review the samples, guess what we have? We have intellectual property. We have a minimal viable product of that intellectual product uh, property. And now I can use that asset to go sell. There's, some, there's an event coming up soon called Astra. And I know you guys are probably getting tired of my toy analogies, but we heavy in the toy business now. So you guys got to bear with me. At least till we get, you know, out of this, out of this, whatever it is, right? Uh, or, or we might be stuck in it. And you guys are going to come for the journey of us being in the toy business. Um, we can go pitch that. I could take a prototype. There's an event coming up. I can go pitch it to distributors. So now it could be in uh, uh, Walmarts, in Roses, in Dollar Generals, in Targets, in, you know, et cetera, different places. There is events where people go and distributors are looking for what are good products that we can put on the shelves that will get more sales for our locations, right? So I want you all to stop thinking about are you overcharged? Now, 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 is it possible to overcharge? Yes. Again, clarity on overcharging. Are you selling junk? All right. That's probably the nicest way I can say it. All right. If you know that what you're selling is not a, the highest quality product, service, or information that you could possibly give that man or woman, then I feel like, yes, it's overpriced. And it's overpriced whether you charge them a dollar for it, whether you give it to them for free, whether you charge them a million dollars for it, right? Because even if you give it to them for free, you wasted their time, they'll never get back. So when it comes to overcharging somebody, are you just selling them something that's going to give them less of a return than the amount of money that they gave you for that product, that service, that information, right? And that could be any price point. But if you truly know that this is the highest quality version of the thing that you can create, right? You would be happy if your grandmama bought this. You would be happy if your kids bought this, if your mom bought this, right? You don't care, right? I know this is that good. Anybody can have this because I, I did my best, right? It, it's not going to be perfect because there's no such thing as a perfect product, service, or information. But you genuinely put a 100% effort in trying to create your theme, right? If you did that, because that's the prerequisite for this, then yes, 1,000%, I feel like you should target whatever people find that most value, all right? And in this case, manufacturers should target businesses that want to create tabletop games and not individuals that want to make one-off games just to play it with their friends every now and then, right? So they charge a premium to really reject those men and women that are not looking to do business, 
but people that are just trying to get, you know, a cool little thing that will waste their time and resources, right? Are we clear on that? Are we clear on that? All right. So create and market product services and information that are mutually beneficial for you and the buyer, but target the people that can comfortably pay your prices. If you want to help the little person, you can help them at a discounted price once you make your money. Or if you really wanted to, you can help them for absolutely free if you don't want to help them for a discounted price down the line. All right. Boom, boom, boom. Where we at with it? Uh, boom, boom, boom. Yep, yep, yep. Jumping around the networking. Uh, nah, nah, I'm not going off grid. Yep, yep. We just country people. All right. Um, boom, boom, boom. All right, see some networking going on. Somebody asking your opinion on some things. I'm going to jump over that. All right. Dun, dun, dun. Boom, boom, boom. Somebody said, no way a tax write off for an attempt at making myself richer. All right, talk, talk to your CPA. All right. Yep, you don't take my word for it. Talk to my C talk to your CPA, right? I was about to say, talk to my CPA. Talk to your CPA. All right. Um is B2B for people who just started business or for people who have been in business for a long time? Honestly, it's for both. I think it makes the most sense for everybody, but I encourage you if you are a new entrepreneur to go B2B because it's an easier way to make a lot of money, right? B2B is an easier way to make a lot of money, all right? And when I think about it, uh, B2B, my first business that made six figures was an independent courier service. I was in my own LLC and I partnered with uh, 3PL, which stands for a third-party logistics company. So manufacturers, believe it or not, operate in their zone of genius, right? Or the good ones do, which is why you guys hear me and other people always say, find your zone of genius, stay in your zone of genius, outsource everything except your zone of genius. So as a medical courier, a lot of these pharmaceutical companies, they just want to make the best pharmaceuticals they can. They don't want to be delivery companies. So they'll find a third party logistics company and say, hey, look, I make this pharmaceutical or this medical supply thing. We got customers in these areas. We want you all to take over making sure that our high quality product gets to our value customers. But we don't want to worry about semi trucks and freight and blah, 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 blah. We make pharmaceuticals. So, they'll give the contract to 3PLs, right? Reason why typically 3PLs get them and not me or you is because we got to think about it. A pharmaceutical company might have a contract with every, and I'm going to just use this as an example, every Walmart, right? So let's say that they deliver to Walmart pharmacies so people can go pick up their medicine from Walmart, right? Can you as an individual service every Walmart between the hours that Walmart opens and closes? No, right? No, there's too many of them. So they'll find a 3PL and a 3PL will take the big contract and they'll bust it down. And okay, well, JT, you can do these within a reasonable amount of time. Okay, this person can do these in a reasonable amount of time. And now all of that can be done in an efficient way. Right. But that was a B2B deal. My client wasn't Walmart. My client was the 3PL. If Walmart had an issue with something that I or one of my drivers did, they called the 3PL. Right. And the 3PL would call me 
and get on me, and then I would have to get on my drivers or fix the problem myself if I messed it up, right? So B2B businesses, I'm biased for. It is the easiest way to make, you know, good money because you don't have to figure out everything, right? And you don't have to have the resources. If I wanted to be a 3PL, I needed to have warehouses. I needed to have employees. I needed to have a track and trace system, right? There's all of these things that will cost millions of dollars, let's just be real, to create just to get the contract, right? I don't know about you, but I don't want to spend millions of dollars up front just to get the contract, right, and then hope I turn a profit off of the contract. Why not do a B2B transaction where I could just show up with my cargo van, my box truck, my sprinter van, right? They already got the infrastructure they give me this route and I could just expand within that 3PL across multiple routes, right? But I'm not trying to dim your light. If you want to go become a 3PL, you can, but it just doesn't make sense for a lot of people, all right? Um, boom, boom, boom. Uh, so that's it on B2B. So serve those that have the funds 100%, all right? Uh, boom, boom, boom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, these playing cards are just the basic one to three dollar pack of cards that they sell everywhere, right? I just needed them because I needed some data off of a standard playing card for my manufacturer. Um, boom, boom, boom. All right, see some people talking about okay, that that's in reference to the networking that was above. So, like I said, you guys can check out the networking just for the sake of time. Um, Boom, boom, boom. I'm with you. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, so people just talking about different side hustles in the chat. If you guys want to uh, check it out, right? Matter of fact, with somebody watching this after the fact, let me know if you can see the live chat. I know sometimes I can, sometimes I can't after the video is done. Um, so people just giving out gems on different things like that. All right, if you have no money, Cannot, pay, cannot afford to pay for a program, uh, what do you suggest? I suggest that you go resell. Learn to resell and resell other people's products um, for them, right? So um, in business, you know, that it just is what it is. Selling is not a bad thing. That's why I always tell you guys, I was one of those people that thought selling was uh, fast talking people and taking advantage of them. And I was, you know, against selling for many years because I was like, I'm not with that. But then when somebody explained to me, no, actual selling, ethical selling is identifying what people already want and then helping them get it. So if I can't identify what you want, right? Like I told you guys, if you want to have a business that consistently makes 100K a year, right, and you're struggling to figure it out, there's a program underneath this video for it. If you have no interest in making 100 k a year or more in business, which is fine, I know people that say, hey, 85 k a year, my house paid off, my car paid off, I'm chilling, right? I don't even need six figures. And I respect it. As long as you can take care of your financial responsibilities, you're not doing anything unethical, immoral, you know, stuff like that, cool. Right. You don't have to have six figures to be happy. It's different person to person. Right. Or if you say, I don't want to do a business. Right. I want to invest. I just want to put my money in an investment and let it uh, accumulate or work for me over time. Right. So that's that's all that program is for. Right. So going back to the question, just to make sure I answer all angles of it. Right. Um, selling is identifying what people want and helping them get it, and if your product, service, or information can help them get it, you sell it. If it, if you can't, you don't, right? I've never been married before, all right? Lord willing, maybe one day I will be. If somebody came to me and said, hey, JT, I want you to do some marriage counseling, I can't help you, right? I don't have anything that I can give you that can help you have a long, sustainable marriage. i never been married before, don't know nothing about being married, Right. I, hey, maybe I can refer you. Hey, so-and-so been married 50 years. You can go talk to them. 
right? Or maybe you could go to this counselor that specializes in marriage counseling, all right? And I think the problem that a lot of us have is we're we're so stuck on, I'm going to try to sell everything to everybody, right? And that's not how you build real long-lasting businesses that are going to have the longevity you want and the legs that you want, right? Meaning the sustainability that you want um, in it. So I would I would get into reselling. And if you had anything valuable, I would start off reselling that stuff. I would resell it on, I'm biased, so just know that. I would start reselling it on eBay and Macari. Amazon is the big fish, though. So Amazon is the best. All right? I hate to admit it in case my, my boy Trav watching. Amazon is the best. I'm biased to eBay and Macari because I made more money off of eBay and Macari than Amazon. Now, Trav made way more money reselling than I ever made, though, right? But that's what I would do. I would go find people that had physical products that they were okay with parting ways with, and I would go sell it for them, and I would split the profits, right? Uh, matter of fact, back in the day, and um, it's a YouTube video on this channel. Man, it the, the YouTube video is really, really old. There's a gentleman in that video by the name of Brother Strickland. Uh, Brother Strickland not even living anymore. You know, uh, uh, he passed away. But um, anyway, there's a YouTube video on this channel. You don't got to go back and rewatch it unless you want to. Where me and Brother Strickland went to the flea market. And I just was doing a video on seeing, comparing selling online to selling at a flea market, basically. And um, a couple of things So really not much of nothing, right? It was a slow day at the flea market, to be honest. So I told him, hey, you could take your items back home if you want to, or I'm going to list all my stuff online to finish making this video. Um, I would list your stuff as well if you, if you, you know, don't mind, right? So he was like, well, I don't want the stuff uh, listed online with your stuff and we can split the money. So that's what I did. So I sold all of my stuff and all of his stuff uh, on eBay after the flea market. And that was the YouTube video in a nutshell, right? But um, older cat, little brother Strickland to death. Um, he's no longer with us. But the whole reason I even tell you guys that story is because there are people out there that have things that they either want to sell or they don't mind selling. And if you're able to go sell that for them, they don't mind in allowing you to participate um, in the upside. So that's what I would do. And that's what I've done before. Right. So, so that way, you know, it's just not theory. Me just saying, Oh, you should go do something I've never done before. So not only did I, uh, do it in the past, there's a YouTube video on this channel, uh, as well. Maybe, maybe somebody here has seen that video before where I was at the flea market. All right. With that gentleman. Um, boom, boom, boom. So, yep, yep, breaking that down. Um, boom, boom. B2B is not for all businesses, am I right? Can one sell digital products B2B? Yeah, software is a digital product, all right? I think lots of times, social media, matter of fact, I believe social media has conditioned people to think that digital products are are only ebooks and courses, right? But long before uh, we were out here saying, you know, check out our ebook, check out our courses. And I'm not bashing ebooks and courses. I love ebooks. I love courses. I literally bought a course before I came on live, right? <laughs> so, and I'm not even talking about selling courses. Like I went and bought somebody else's course before I even joined, uh, jumped on this live to have this conversation with you. Right. So there's nothing wrong with selling ebooks and courses, but for clarity, long before the wave was ebooks and courses, SaaS was a thing, software as a service, right? Microsoft Office Suite, Excel, right? Word, all of these other tools. Uh think about um if you have any kind of virus protection on your computer. These are things that you can go have developed for you on freelancer.com. You can go buy off a of flipper. You can go to Fiverr and Upwork if you wanted something unique done, right? So, 
Or if you just that talented, you can make your own. But I'm not that talented, so I go to marketplaces and either have it made or I um or I buy it um uh if it's already something that I want. Right? So yes, in a nutshell, yes, you can sell B2B to businesses. You can sell B2B, you can't sell software B2B. You guys know I'm getting tongue tied now. All right. You can sell software B2B. Uh yes, to answer your question. All right. Um we touched on reselling. Matter of fact, let me let me let me give this. Let me give you a quick example. Right? Real quick example. Um, can I share my screen? I think you guys can can see it. Okay. eBay. Everybody's heard of this website before. It's Sunday. Well, when I'm recording it live, it's Sunday. There's no telling when you're watching this. All right. So, because it's Sunday. Uh, I'm going to just put in Holy Bible as the product, all right? Um, this is what I would do. And, of course, insert whatever your product is. I'm just using this because I think it's appropriate on a Sunday. Um, I type it in. If it has a barcode, when you download the app on your phone, you can actually scan the barcode. Um, or you could type it in manually as well, like I just did. Um, and I think sometimes you can take an image of it. I don't really like that feature. Um, but back to what I was doing. Did I already pass it? Running my mouth. Okay. So type in whatever the product is. Um, I'm doing this on a laptop. So just understand on mobile, you might have the clicks, uh, you know, some buttons to get here, but I've been doing this on mobile more times than I did it on desktop. So you... You guys are smarter than me. You can figure it out. What we want to see is we want to see the sold items, right? I call them the sold listings, but the sold items, right? It says show only, sold items. The reason why we click on this is because anybody can list anything they want on eBay within reason. So I can list a Bible or a, or a toy or a microphone or candy and say, I'll sell it to you for $13 trillion. That does not mean that anybody is going to buy it for $13 trillion, right? So I'm going to go to the sold listings because I want to see what they're actually selling for. Uh, disclaimer here. This is a bad example because I probably should have a specific Bible. There's a whole lot of Bibles out there. So understand your listing will be better than this because you would have an exact product. Um, but okay, today is the seventh. I see this style, Holy Bible, King James Version, Nelson 884 BG Giant Print, Reference Concordance. Okay, you guys can read it. Um, and I'm looking at how much stuff sells for here. All right. So what I would do if I had a Bible for sale, I would type in a more specific Bible. This is like the Bible that be in pretty much every church. Like, I don't know about y'all church, but I see those Bibles a lot. All right. Um, and then I would go and compare what I see here with uh with what I can get it for. All right. So this one is $20.36, $39.99. All right. And you can sort this as well, too. Um, I like the way that they sort it because it's telling me when did it sell. So right here, I'm highlighting uh, the date that it sold. That's what I'm looking at. And I'm looking at the price. And what I want to know is, is this number, whatever this number could be, is this at least three times less than what I paid for it? That's me. That's just my rule of thumb. Some people say higher than that. I'm cool with at least three times. Why? Because eBay charges fees and there'll be shipping costs. Even if there's free shipping, soft cover used. So this right here says free shipping, right? They still have to, whoever sold this still has to pay for shipping. Uh, it being a book, they're going to probably ship it via media mail. Um, or I hope I would, they would they only sold it for $4.55. So they'll probably send it as media mail. Uh, which has usually a cheaper rate um, as well, right? So I hope you guys get this. So I would look at the items I already have and 
I would type some things in here. All right. I'm looking at the chat to make sure that we got it. All right. And I, I don't have a specific product, but you guys get the gist of it. I, I would guess, right? Um, One more thing I could show you guys, too, is uh, let's say that I could find... Mm, if I could find... That's not it. Uh, New King James Version Bible Large Print. Um, sometimes I see the ones that they sell in Walmart, which of course now that I'm, okay, this one. So this one right here, um, I see in Walmart. All right. I know some of y'all are bougie people and shop at Tarjay. Uh, sometimes I'm feeling bougie and I shop at Tarjay as well, but, um, we shop everywhere. So if I wanted to copy, all right. So this, matter of fact, let me make it big. I don't know why I'm making it hard. So this is, uh, you can get this Bible out of Walmart. So let me see if I can, if it would work, let's see. I'm doing this live. So what I would be doing, the point that I'm making here, because I don't want to spend a whole lot of time doing this because you guys get the point. I'm looking to see. If I can get it cheaper, matter of fact, this looks like one we saw earlier. That's $92.03. Um, maybe that wasn't the one we saw earlier. <laughs> so I could come to websites like Walmart. Um, you can also source locally. I would recommend in the beginning, start with stuff you already got. Don't go buy stuff and then resell it. Sell what you already got first. But it might be possible that you can go online and find and find this stuff for uh, cheaper on other websites and then make money off the arbitrage, right? So, long-winded answer, but uh, definitely wanted to tell you guys that it's because somebody asked, and you guys know I'm really big on learning reselling, and after you learn reselling, um, I, I want you all to go from selling one-to-one -one to selling one-to-many, all right? So, selling on... Uh, eBay is a great skill. It, it'll be a way that you can always make some money if times get hard. Be proactive, not reactive, like we always say. All right. Um, what's up, Brandy? Brandy say you can become a loan broker. That's a fact. Um, boom, boom, boom. See where we left off with it. Yep, yep, yep. Somebody said, how can someone do the revenue share program with you like the example you showed, right? So um, if your business is already doing um, a quarter million dollars a year, like just being honest, I'm not meaning this in any derogatory way, just being honest and answering the question. The question again was, how can someone do the revenue share program with you? Like the example you showed, it's for businesses that are already doing a quarter million dollars a year. Um, and if you are already doing a quarter million dollars a year, um, you can reach out to me um, as well. Uh, and if you are, just let me know. The best way is probably right now, since we're redoing our website, but you can still go to authorjt.com and fill out the contact form there. Um, and then my VA will see it, and then they'll... If, if it uh then they'll send it over to me if um if they can't address it um but that's the best way right so through the website website is author jt right yep author jt.com as well but it's only for businesses that are doing a quarter million dollars or more like i told you guys like i'm your cousin jt i'm not here trying to make you buy something that i don't think is going to to benefit you just so uh, I can ride Lamborghinis. I don't own a Lamborghini, by the way, but uh, and that's not a knock to anybody. But um, yeah, we uh, we work with those businesses. If that's you, you can hit the website. All right. Um, how would you compare affiliate marketing to reselling in terms of difficulty? Right, reselling is easier than affiliate marketing. 
All right, so Daryl L said, how would you compare affiliate marketing to reselling? So affiliate marketing, for anybody that does not know, is you go out and you go sell somebody else's product, service, or information. All right, you got to know how to sell in order to be an affiliate marketer. This doesn't mean that you got to go door to door knocking and pitching people, uh, but you have to have some way of getting people's attention, whether, whether it's offline or online, and converting that man or woman into, or business, if you going to take my advice and go B2B, um, and convert that man, woman, or business into a, uh, into a sale. Reselling is more about pattern recognition. Right. So we go to the soul listings. We see what's already been selling. We look for a frequency in selling. We look for the arbitrage between what we pay and what it's selling for. And all businesses rely on data driven decisions. So the reason why I preach reselling for a lot of people that don't know how to resell is because you're going to be a terrible reseller if you don't understand how to make data driven decisions and you're going to take the same skill set of making data-driven decisions to every other business that you do, right? And, and I tell people that's the unsexy part of business that makes you a ton of money, right? So everything sucks until the money starts rolling in and then you're going to say, man, I love looking at the soul listings and they have paid software uh, as well that you can do. But uh, I recommend if you're strapped for cash, have a small budget, uh, just start there, all right? Uh, so yes, Comparing the two, reselling is easier than affiliate marketing. You'll make more money affiliate marketing. Um, but again, if you already know how to sell, then affiliate marketing all the way. All right. Boom, 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 boom. All right. Yep. Same answer, Benji. Reselling. All right. Definitely reselling. If, if I needed money quickly. All right. Relatively speaking, because, you know, quick to some people is within a week. Uh, shoot, some of my mentors is like getting rich quick is before you die, right? So quick is a relative term. So so I would definitely say, um, depending on how you define quickly, right, uh, reselling it will be the easiest. All right, it'll definitely be the easiest. All right, uh, boom, boom, boom. All right, so I'm going to jump in and out of the chat as well. I'm going to skip over the networking. I want to make sure I touch on everything. Um, sp speaking of, uh, you know, reselling and business and in the same vein, I also want you all to not become an island. I, I suggest that you network, right? Here's a little secret for everybody that's on the, the, the video this long. I now pay for courses, go to conferences, like join meetups, like when you guys hear me say I spend 90 grand a year or whatever I spend this year on financial literacy, I go for the people more than I go for the information, right? What I can tell you from firsthand experience is that you can have one professional relationship that can make you hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars, right? So, for example, one conference that I'm going to near the end of this month is going to cost like 7500 bucks, right? The kind of people that make sense to be my partners for my marketing business, so the, the clients that can easily say yes to my offer, pay my initial fee, and then we can create numbers like this or greater for are going to be at this event, right? So, and this is just in the past 30 days. This is a client that wants to work with me for 12 months, right? So, simple math, because I'm a simple man. If I'm going to spend $7,500 to go to a conference, and there's over 100 people that's going to be at the conference, I only need to build one professional relationship. And essentially, the way my mind works, the conference is free, right? I'm going to make a new friend, a new business partner, right? And going to make more than enough money for them to be happy and enough money to recoup. So I'm about to get a free trip to wherever I'm going for the conference, right? So I believe, and I want to share with you all to become a networking machine, 
All right. If I go to a conference or an event or anything like that and I learn anything, it's a bonus. So I'm going to go to the sessions. I'm going to, you know, take notes and listen and and maybe learn something. I am more interested in the networking than the what the person from stage is saying. And I say that because a lot of people, when they hear come to this conference, go to that conference, the ticket is five hundred dollars, a thousand dollars. $7,500, $10,000, $15,000. The most expensive single ticket that I got invited, uh, and matter of fact, they sent an invitation in the mail, right, Uh, was $50,000. And I haven't made up my mind if I'm going to go or not, right? But it's nothing but millionaires at this event, all right? Matter of fact, if you're not a millionaire, you can't pay 50 grand and go. That's how serious the event is. Right. So if you're not a verifiable millionaire, you can't spend 50 grand and come. All right. Um, Which is why I'm considering going. So the power of networking is it allows you to save time and move faster as an entrepreneur. It allows you to save time and move faster as an entrepreneur. If you have to learn everything yourself through trial and error, if you got to spend all the money figuring out stuff yourself, you're going to be moving at a snail's pace towards your goals. What if you could partner with somebody that has already mastered marketing? You could partner with somebody that's already mastered whatever your deliverable is, right? Somebody that's mastered branding. Somebody mastered taking a company public for those of you out there that want to go all the way to the moon with it, right? Highest pinnacle in business is taking your company public or selling it. That's where the billionaires get created, when you take your company public, all right? But the whole point here is I want to encourage you all to become networking machines, also become learning machines, all right? The example I always tell you guys, what if you were the greatest mechanic in 1960? You said, man, I could fix any car, all right? But then you stopped learning in 1960. Now we got Teslas and all these other electric vehicles and smart cars, and and now... You may not be obsolete, but you definitely aren't as valuable in the marketplace as you as you were in 1960, right? So never stop networking, never stop learning. Here's how I rank it. I know some other people are going to hear this and disagree and, you know, to each their own. So again, this is my bias. I believe that if you're somebody that's trying to get to 30K a month, since that's what we're talking about, all right? If I was trying to get there the fastest way possible, um, there's no one size fit all business. So I'll tell you the industries. I would look at the skilled trades. The skilled trades can get you there. I would look at marketing and whatever sub niche in marketing you want to specialize in. I would look at tech, whether it's physical tech, software tech, AI, selling tech, right? Whatever it is. But between the skilled trades, between marketing, and between tech, under and those are big, broad niches, I know, right? Because not everybody will want to do this specific thing, nor does everybody have to do the same thing to make money, right? Um, so those are the industries that I have seen people scale really, really fast, right? I'm talking about, uh, slow for those industries, if you do it right, is uh, I see people make six figures in eight months, right? So they make six figures in eight months Um, for the people that really get in there and, t- and take it serious. Like, we can always find people in the skilled trades that, you know, they just do enough to get by and they happy and amen to them. Do enough in marketing just to get by. Do enough in tech just to get by. And if they're happy, amen to them. Right. But if if you're really trying to scale up, those businesses have the the upside, in my opinion, to get you there the fastest. Right. Not saying you can't do it in logistics. You can't do it in the food industry or whatever you have in mind. But I'm saying this is my 10th year in entrepreneurship. I've seen a lot. I've done a lot. Those businesses scale really, really fast. Right. If I'm talking to a potential client and they're in the skilled trades, 
they're in marketing, they're in tech, right? I feel like they're going to scale really, really well, right? Not saying that others can't, but for those of you that don't yet have a business, at least, it's at least looking into if you're open to it, all right? Last but not least, it's going to be a no-brainer, but this is a conversation I have with my friends all the time. Everyone here needs to commit to making money faster. That doesn't mean illegitimately. I'm not telling anybody to do any scams or anything crazy like that, right? What I'm saying is this, is that I bought one property or let me just talk about the portfolio. So over the course of like three years, I spent 500, maybe 520 grand in real estate, right? That portfolio has now appreciated over $200,000. So that means if somebody wanted to came today and buy those exact same properties, it would cost them 200,000 more dollars just because they didn't make their money fast enough, right? And that's just a, a, a easy example, right? Still, I learned this in the Marine Corps. So whether you're in the real estate or not, this is a fundamental truth that my Sergeant Major told me. She said, luck favors the prepared. That was one, that was one lesson, right? And the best time to prepare for war is during times of peace. If you ever served in the military or if you've known anybody that ever served in the military, when you sign up for the military, they don't throw you an M16 and give you a plane ticket, right? You go to basic training, you go to boot camp, you go to whatever you call it, right? So you go there and you learn the skills needed, all right? You go there and learn the skills needed so that way if you're ever in that environment, you can perform, all right? So I challenge you all today to commit to, hey, look, if you're trying to go to the next level, ask yourself, are you like that Marine? Because you guys know I serve in the Marines. Are you like that Marine? that's been watching Rambo and the Expendables and any other kind of war movies, right? And you thinking, okay, just throw me a gun, give me a plane ticket and a parachute, I'm gonna jump out and I'm gonna shoot bad guys, right? In real life, that's not how it works, right? And that is for the best interests of the individual, all right? So a lot of people, they wanna go straight to making the money, they wanna go straight into the fight go straight into business, start hooking and jabbing and, and, and doing commerce, right? Do you even know what you're doing? Because the market will force you out, right? If you don't know what you're doing, right? Speaking in business terms, but keeping with our military analogy, your business will die, right? Your business will get killed, right? On the battlefield of the economy, right? If you don't know what you're doing, all right? So if we want to make money faster, first, are we even making money the right way? If you're sub 100K a year, are you B2B? If you're sub 100K and you're against going B2B, do you have a realistic plan to make that money B2C? Or are you romanticizing your business and saying, you know, because it's my business and it's my baby, I know that I can be the exception to the rule. Can people make a lot of money B2C? Absolutely, right? Does it make sense for the average small business? No, it doesn't, right? The margins are different, right? If I tried to, if I tried to resell these, they, they sell these in dollar stores, they sell these in Walmarts. I don't know what Walmart, you know, uh, spends on them, but I do know as somebody that is working with several manufacturers on several different products, that the more they buy, the less they spend. So let's say if we're going to sell them for a dollar, let's say that the manufacturer may tell me, hey, JT, you can get them for 20 cents. I'll sell them to you in bulk. You got to get 500 or 2,500 of them, but I'll cut you a deal, 20 cents a pack. Put them on the shelf for a dollar, two dollars, three dollars. You got them in bulk, 20 cent a pack, make your money. Sounds like a great deal, right? Get them for 20 cent, sell them for a dollar, two dollars, three dollars, right? Walmart comes and Walmart can order way more than 500 or 2,500, all right? Let's say that the manufacturing cost of these, because they make them in bulk, 
So they order all the materials in bulk and they're really efficient. They can get down to making these to around two cent a pack, right? They bought all the materials in bulk, the machines that they're using. When they factor in how many they make in this short amount of time, they can make it for two cent a pack, right? Guess what? If Walmart says we'll give you three cent a pack, but we'll buy 10 million of them and distribute them across every Walmart in the whole United States, right? You think they're going to turn around and say no to Walmart, right? Not only are they going to say yes because they want that initial offer, they know Walmart probably not going nowhere anytime soon. So if you came and get 10 million of them today, you might come back again and need another 5 million, 10 million, right? How often is JT going to come back and say he want 500, 2,500, even is JT ever going to even come back and say he want 10,000, right? Most businesses are not ordering that volume, all right? So doing low ticket sales is possible, but you got to understand me and you could be selling the same thing, but I make more money off of it because I got a better deal than you, right? That's true in business. That's true in banking, all right? Bank of America, they give me a half a percent, which is nothing, but Bank of America always, you know, want to remind me that I get half a percent higher interest rates than the average banker, be, uh, not the average banker, than, than the average consumer uh, because I, I keep my balance at blah, 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 right? So the analogy there, the truth there is that I, I don't want you to get into this, this rut of having to sell low ticket because you have imposter syndrome. You don't believe that you're worth it or you believe that that's where you got to start and work your way up, right? That is not the truth. Make money faster by creating the best version of your product, your service, your information, targeting people that have the buying power with the solution that they want. So when you're going to those people, adopt the selling of buying that JT has. I want to know what you're trying to get anyway. And then if my product, my service, my information can help you get that result faster, more efficiently, or et cetera, amen, boom, right? If it's not good enough to, to give to your grandmama, it's not good enough to sell it to a stranger, right? That's how I define ethical business, all right? Does that make sense? Again, if you came in the room late, you can watch the replay. If you're a business owner here that is not consistently making 100K a year because we're talking about 30K a month, and to some people, I'm not going to lie to you. When I told people, and this was years ago, probably 2018, yeah, 20. 2018, 2019, something like that. Don't hold me to it. Let's just call it four, four or five years ago. I told people four or five years ago, my goal is to make 30 grand a month. And people laughed in my face. Bruh, how in the world you going to make 30 grand a month? For what? What, what you going to sell that somebody going to give you that much money? And who you going to sell it to? Because ain't nobody going to give you that much money, Right? And you have to get out of those environments. That's why digital mentors help. If you can't physically get around, you know, get in those rooms, as people say, right? Continue to tune in to me. Subscribe to the channel if you knew. If you know somebody that you feel like they want to do better, but they don't know what better looks like, share these videos with them, right? Hopefully inspire them to, okay, even though the people around me, Got a crab, uh, got a crab in a barrel mentality, right? I understand that crabs was never intended to be in a barrel, so I'm not going to operate like my environment. Instead of being a product of of, of my environment, I'm going to be a resource within my environment. That's the paradigm shift that we got to make. A lot of us that are stuck physically in those environments, instead of being a product of my environment, I'm going to become a resource within my environment, right? So that way I can add value to myself, to others, to the overall thing. And eventually maybe I can move out of that environment if I feel like that's best. Or maybe I'll improve the environment that I'm in if I feel like that's best. Right? That's a decision you have to make depending on your environment. But I want you to develop this mindset of we need to start making money faster. 
Which direction is the cost of things going in? Up or down? You guys tell me. What direction is, is the price of things going in? Up or down? If we look on average year after year, right? Whether we're talking about the price of cars, the cost of homes, cost of grocery. If we look on average year after year, what direction is the price of everything going? Up or down? All right. I'm going to read through these messages real quick. Boom, boom, boom. See some networking going on. Boom, boom, boom. Oh, yeah. Believe it or not, the richest people that I know and the most money that I've ever made has came from networking, right? Partnering up with other businesses, other men, other women, uh, and either me providing services to them B2B and getting compensated, uh, me learning from them B2B and then applying that to my business, um, you know, Whatever, right? But B2B relationships through networking has been my 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 biggest uh needle movers, right? My biggest needle movers. All right. Uh, boom, boom, boom. Oh, yep, yep, yep. They definitely not laughing now. Yep, yep. So this this is a brand new client. All right, and you guys are probably tired of seeing it, so this is the last time I'm gonna show it. All right, so this is a brand new client. All right, whichever side of it is on, right? So this is my newest client, and like I said, these clients were already making a quarter million dollars a year without me. So let's say, and this person was making way more than a quarter million dollars a year. This person was making uh seven figures, right? Well, this is a business, but of course the business is owned by somebody. So when I say business, when I say person. I'm, I'm using that synonymously, right? So this business, this person was making seven figures, a million dollars plus before they even knew I existed, before I even knew they existed, right? So this is just on top of what they were already doing, right? So they're already doing seven figures a year and, and I'm contributing month one of us doing business together. I contributed, if you subtract, number on the left is what I charge. Number on the right is what they made. So I'm increasing their bottom line on average uh, a little over 300 grand a year. And we just getting started. My goal for these clients is to add, uh, you know, hopefully uh, an extra million to this particular client. All right. It's different client to client, just to be honest. So I tell all of my clients, bare minimum, you're going to make an extra 100 grand a year uh, because you got to tell them something. So I tell them worst case scenario. You make an extra hundred grand on top of, uh, you make all your money back that you invested plus a hundred grand. That's worst case scenario. Best case scenario, I usually tell them I don't know, right? Uh, because I want to over deliver. So if they're okay with worst case scenario, I make all my money back plus a hundred grand. Cool, right? And then when we have months like this, they're like, shoot, I'm gonna make you know, I've already made my money back. Uh, and I'm going to cross over a hundred grand in probably, you know, four to six months. All right. And that's terrible, honestly. Like, so my goal for this particular client is to get them over a hundred grand, uh, in less than 90 days. Uh, there, there's some things that we didn't even, we didn't even do right in my opinion. Um, and so that's neither here nor there. The whole point here is I want you all to know everybody here can make $30,000 a month and never go broke again if you follow the principles that we covered today. If you're a business owner that's not consistently making 100K a year, 30 grand a month can sound astronomical. Um, and I want you to be inspired that you can make that amount of money. But I also want you to know that, hey, if you need a starting point, I do have a program that's designed to teach you, here's how you consistently make 100 grand a year, right? Here's how you consistently do it, all right? My business, uh... I don't want to lie to you. 
So we crossed over a hundred grand for the year in like February, right? I want to say January, but I don't remember the exact dates. It might have been the end of January, right? So, and I'm talking about just counting the money we made that year. So by February, my business has already made six figures for the year. So if my goal was I want to make a hundred thousand and then I want to go on vacation, I will be on vacation now until next January, I guess. Right. And I'm not saying that to brag or to boast. I'm saying that to hopefully inspire those of you out there. So if your goal is a hundred grand in a year, 100%, right. That's like 8,300, a little over $8,300 a month. We can for sure get you there uh, in your business. Right. And beyond. But if that's your first milestone, which I recommend that it should be, then for sure. Right. For sure. All right. And if my mentor is on this live, I'm going to get yelled at again because uh, on our coaching call today, he was telling um, all of us. So the new people and the people that have been on it for a while, uh, he was like, you don't have a real business unless you make a million dollars gross a year. All right. But um, I'm not here telling you guys that if your business doesn't make a million dollars gross a year to cousin JT, you still got a business. Right. Maybe in the future. Um, and you guys let me know in the comment section down below if you guys want to start having those higher level conversations. Um, and yo, yeah, yeah, but I, I think right now let's start with a hundred K, uh, let's start with a hundred K a year. And then let's, let's see what the overall consensus of the family is from there. Right. Hey, see you guys in the next one. If you got questions, ask questions underneath this video. If you need help making a hundred K. Check out the program link underneath the video. Till next time, Tom Hustler, stay hustling. JT Automations, I'm gone.